afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much to BookNet Canada for inviting Editor to speak at your conference here today. Um, I'm here to talk to you about accessible publishing and what this means to all of us here. Specifically, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what print impairment is, how decent accessibility to content is relevant to all of us, and the project that we at Editeur are involved with, in particular the guidelines we have produced on accessible publishing. Ideally, I'd be delighted if everyone left this session feeling a little more informed, and most importantly, with the firm belief that they could do something now to face this challenge head on. So making a difference within your own companies will inevitably involve understanding something of your end reader's needs, recognizing how digital publishing can provide accessibility opportunities, acknowledging that you can influence accessibility in your own particular role, and implementing good accessibility practice as part of a coherent quality assurance process. So I'd like to start by posing a question to you all. How do you choose to read content? As mature adults, we're all different, and we have different preferences when it comes to relaxing with a good book. So there are many ways to read. In an armchair with a fresh coffee, on the train, on the way to work, in bed, on the beach, the list is long. And it's even longer when we now consider the greater opportunities that e-books have given us. We can now read almost anywhere we like. And added to that, we can choose to read on our cell phones, on our tablets, on e-readers, on our computers, wherever and however we choose. So we all choose the option that suits us best. We choose the way we access content. And for many of us, this works very well. And we are all currently enjoying good accessibility to the huge range of reading options available to us. But that's not the case for everyone. And as you'll see during the course of this presentation, it might very well not always be the case for you, depending on where, how, and when you choose to access your reading material. So I'd like to introduce you to Alexia in this picture here, who illustrates this point very nicely, I think, in the following clip prepared by the RNIB in the UK. If you were blind like Alexia, which stories would you have missed? So I'd imagine we'd all like to give Alexia access to as many books as she would like to read. But who exactly does print impairment affect? In particular, accessibility issues with content affect the print impaired i.e. those who have difficulty engaging with printed content. I'll explain further over the course of the next few slides. But firstly, statistics tell us that 10% of people in the developed world and 15% in the developing world have some degree of print impairment. Isn't that amazing? 10% of the population may not be able to access your printed content. Imagine how that might affect sales if they could. Print impairment affects a reader's ability to engage with printed material and includes those with visual impairment, whether blind or partially sighted, dyslexia, motor disabilities, and age-related macular degeneration. So to look at these in a little more detail, for those who are blind or partially sighted, the issues of discovering content, actually reading the content and purchasing the content are huge. The emergence of e-books has effectively made every book a large print book and coupled with screen readers, text-to-speech availability and devices that allow full navigation, 
there are great opportunities ahead. If you're dyslexic, then printed material can present you with an enormous challenge. There are many different degrees of dyslexia, and I can't begin to explain the full experience here today. But it can be an extremely disconcerting experience for readers when the text floats around the page or individual letters change places in some instances. E-books and e-readers, if packaged and enabled correctly, can offer an enormous amount of variation in how dyslexic readers look at text. In many cases, it's been found that simply by allowing the reader to change the font and background colour of the page, that some of these problems disappear. For some people, a good combination is a large sans serif font in black on a pale yellow background. The text calms down, even settles down for some, enabling the reader to actually read rather than guess or give up. There are some other equally popular colour combinations. This is just one example. So print impairment can also affect those with motor disabilities, as the physical act of holding a book can be enormously difficult. And once again, the issue of discovering and purchasing contents are also relevant here combining together to create a wall of inaccessibility for the reader. So this next clip shows how this Harry Potter-loving reader who has a severe back problem is able to enjoy his favourite stories in far greater comfort now that he can access them digitally. Yeah, a couple of years ago I worked for a, a gas company um, working with cylinders. I ruptured two discs and fractured a vertebra. I know you're a big Harry Potter fan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how, do you, how do you read the Harry Potter books? I have managed to be able mm -hmm. to do it over the course of a couple of weeks, be able to read through thick books, <laughs> but it's very uncomfortable having to move adjust myself with sciatica and all kinds of things. Um, it takes a long time. I am constantly moving, my arms ache trying to hold the book at different angles, mm -hmm. flip pages and all kinds of things. Um, the only solution I found was to go over to an e-reader. New devices that are now available can alleviate the physical challenges that the act of reading can pose. And online purchasing opportunities mean that the, reader can now or that the readers can now order their content from the relative comfort of home. Age-related macular degeneration can seriously affect our ability to read, with the text being far too small and lines becoming distorted. As I mentioned earlier, the arrival of e-books potentially makes every book a large print book, provided the file format and device allow the text to be manipulated. And for an ageing population, well, Microsoft has stated that by the year 2015, there will be 1.2 billion computer users over the age of 55. So we can see that the market for e-books is growing for the print impaired community and for our ageing population. Accessible e-books will become more and more important to all of us. So accessibility could affect any one of us. As you can see here, I don't find that particularly easy to read. But I would also like to impress upon everyone that we all currently take advantage of the accessibility features that technology has to offer. And we will do so even more as ebooks become more accessible. Choice of access isn't necessarily limited to those with print impairment. The issue of accessibility can and will affect us all. Today's readership needs to be able to consume technology in a variety of different ways, and publishing's metamorphosis from a print-dominated into a mixed and inexorably into a digitally-led industry presents an unprecedented opportunity for publishers to extend their products to the widest possible audience. For many of us, the way we choose to access content is a personal and situational decision. Trying to read our smartphone screen in bright sunlight. Trying to hear someone talking to us on the phone as we walk past roadworks. This sort of challenge gives us all a need for different types of access to our technology. The individual choices of each consumer are driving the digital changes in our industry. <coughs> the publishing industry is being given the opportunity to make accessibility easy for us, to deliver through mainstream production and distribution processes in ways that have simply not been available to us before. 
the switch to digital means that our mainstream publications can become accessible and we can create a situation in which those who are print disabled simply form another sector of the mainstream market. Well, just to give you a brief example of how truly life-enhancing new technology can be for someone who is print impaired, I have one final short clip for you of a blind student reading a text message from his iPhone with the use of a braille reader. Now, it's not an e-book, but this is a very good example of how new technology can revolutionise the reading experience. Can you tell us what it's saying? Uh, quick email before we travel down to meet you in Gatwick tomorrow to see thank you for including me in this trip and uh, el elected to be informed tax field. So what is an accessible ebook file? Well, this has provoked huge amounts of discussion in many different forums, not least the meetings on accessible metadata, which I shall mention later. But essentially, an, e an accessible ebook is one where it allows the reader to manipulate the text according to his or her own personal requirements via a meaningful structure within the document, to navigate the content with relative ease, and to make full, sorry, to make use of full enabled func fully enabled functions within the document, such as text-to-speech, alternative text, long description, etc. And to have full discoverability via metadata that has made use of accessible descriptions, which are now available. For me and for many, these are the main points, but it is worth po pointing out here that accessibility means different things to different people. And it's not an on-off switch. Rather, it's a, set of gra it's a granular set of features which may or may not be required by the individual reader. For a title to be accessible, it involves a combination of three interactive strands. The technical nature of the ebook file package, which we're looking at here today in this session and the next session. The technical ability of assistive technologies, screen readers, magnifiers, ebook readers and daisy players, for example. And the skills of the users and their familiarity with using their assistive technologies to interact with the accessible title. So what can we do as publishers to ensure that our book formats and digital content are accessible, are as accessible as they can be right now and in the future as workflows and file formats develop? How can we assist this extraordinary revolution and what benefits are there to our own business if we do so? Well, why should you do this? What are the benefits to your business? You should do this simply because it is the right thing to do. As we've already seen, you can assist a large proportion of the potential market for books to have access to your content, and this has got to be a good thing. You should do it because there are legal requirements in place that expect you to do this, and these will become more and more stringent. I can't talk too much about this today, or indeed answer questions about legal and licensing issues because I'm afraid that they are different in every single territory. But um, do try to make yourself aware of the situation in your own country. And finally, you should do this because there is a clear commercial benefit for your business, a huge potential growth in the market for your books. I refer once again to the staggering figure of 10% of the population in the developed world having some degree of print impairment. While there is help at hand, the Enabling Technologies Framework Project is a three-year WIPO, that's the World Intellectual Property Organization, sponsored project under its Visually Impaired Persons Initiative to facilitate access to copyrighted works for people with print disabilities. Our editor is delivering this project in collaboration with the DAISY Consortium and its aim is to provide guidance and advice to publishing companies worldwide in their endeavours to provide accessible digital content to the print impaired. 
The main deliverable for editor thus far on the project has been the production of a set of best practice guidelines for the publishing industry, which were published last April and endorsed by the International Publishers Association, the Federation of European Publishers, and the International Association of Scientific, Technical and Medical Publishers. The website link and address for the guidelines is available on the small leaflets I've put on each table and on the final slide of this presentation. We have developed, we have attempted to deliver the how in this whole equation. So this straightforward document explains how publishers can tackle both the organisational and the technical aspects of accessibility with a very targeted approach. The guidelines are intended to be directed with specific advice being provided for specific departments in-house. So not too long or wordy, we hope that this will enable all publishers of varying seniority and skills to be able to dip in and research a topic. It's a manual, not a report. So areas that we cover include what is an accessible format, guidelines for senior executives, for your internal accessibility lead, your editorial and design departments, production and IT departments, information on how to conduct an accessibility audit in-house, and how to add structure to your documents, to name but a few. Also it's important to note the guidelines are now available in six languages, English, French, Spanish, Italian, German and Japanese, in a variety of accessible formats via our website and WIPO site. So to get down to some of the detail, and I must stress that this is only some, I'll attempt to give you just a brief taste of this afternoon of the guidelines, but I do urge you to read them for yourselves. So the guidelines identify three routes to accessibility, which are, firstly, publishers may be in a position to supply specialist accessible files themselves when they receive a request from a specific reader. Secondly, publishers may wish to utilise some out-of-house help. And there are various organisations who can help. And these intermediary services can help you to produce accessible files from a variety of different media, and they support people with print disabilities. And thirdly, and ideally, your commercial products will increasingly come to have accessibility built in as a matter of course. The switch to digital in our industry means that our mainstream publications can become accessible. For senior executives, we ask that you put in place a company policy that demands the very best of your employees in your endeavours towards accessible publishing. So by providing the appropriate lead, you are ensuring that your commitment to the accessibility agenda makes it a top priority for everyone in the company. Now, in addition, we urge you to appoint a person responsible for accessibility in-house, an internal advocate, if you like, and it's essential for this person to provide a focal point for all communication and activities. Someone with a passion for accessibility and a strong influence and style. Give this appointment real power within the business to allow them to operate effectively. And finally, we would encourage senior members of staff to really understand the issues that we've talked about and to show their own personal commitment. For the internal advocate, our, our advice gets a little bit more detailed. This position needs to be responsible for documenting and communicating across the company all information pertinent to accessibility. They must promote awareness in-house and they must be capable of influencing decision-making at all levels. For many publishers, the issues of accessibility are not necessarily technical. For many, it's about awareness and communication, and this person provides the solution to this. So we offer advice for this person or team, and believe me, there are teams of accessibility managers in some publishing houses, on how to make a start. In particular, we would encourage them to conduct an accessibility audit and survey so that current in-house practices and capabilities can be established. Potential survey questions are listed, and the section entitled How to Conduct an Accessibility Audit 
lists the technical and non-technical areas that you need to focus on. And in addition, we would urge this person to fully understand the way your business works. It's crucial to get to grips with the workflows and the methods of digital publishing that are employed so that the routes to accessibility can be clearly defined within company procedures. So the guidelines clearly point out the difference between structure, content and appearance and explain how the combination of all three are required for the purposes of accessibility, but that the most accessible files are ones where these can be separated and manipulated individually according to user requirements. For example, by disengaging the appearance and making it malleable, there is greater flexibility in delivery and any number of designs tailored to each individual's needs can be applied to the text. The level of structure that you include in your books will greatly depend on the type of publishing that you are involved in, but you should try to make sure that you include metadata to help make the books more discoverable, a hierarchy of named headings, chapters, sections and subsections that will allow various assistive technologies to navigate, alt text for images, footnotes, and references if appropriate, a logical flow to provide a reading order for your content, running heads and page numbers, index and contents with active hyperlinks, and wherever possible include semantic tagging to aid screen readers. This may seem like a long list, but you'll find that these inclusions just become a part of the process if you build them in from the start. For editors and designers, we've also provided, on how, provided advice sorry, on how to go about preparing your files, ideally ticking accessibility boxes from the outset rather than bolting on options after the file has been completed. So these include choice of font, size and alignment, type of layout, and emphasis on contrast and use of spacing. For illustrated titles or titles including graphic images, there is a clear accessibility issue. And it's beneficial if you're able to supply alternative text, as in many instances, an image provided for sighted people is not the best way to communicate a piece of information for a blind person. A description is a much better option. And I know that Matt's going to be talking about this in greater detail after me. So for the production and IT departments, it's all about what type of file you are able to supply. We all work with a variety of different formats relevant to our particular workflows and type of content. And these formats can provide a varying degree of accessibility and inaccessibility. And I'd like to briefly run through some of these. So Microsoft Word. For many users, particularly in the education sector, this file format offers the easiest route to accessible information as the text content of the file is easily mutable and it can contain all three elements of structure, content and appearance. But unfortunately, as we all know, these files can be problematic to supply as your content will have gone through many cycles of revision since its first creation in Word and the original Word doc file often bears no relation to the finished version. Print-ready PDFs. Well, these are often the least accessible of all file formats, as these particular PDFs contain content and appearance that only minimally reflect structure. There's no reading order, no structure or, structure or semantic tagging. And if these are used, they should be edited in Adobe Acrobat to add tagging. Note that while there are tools to automatically add tagging, human review and editing of the tags is nearly always essential. What about PDFs optimised for digital use? These tend to be more navigable and include structure, so for many users they are a reasonable option, as they can include a reading order, alt tags, and etc. But these files have all three elements of structure, content and appearance. However, they're not necessarily as malleable as some other formats and shouldn't be seen in, as the first choice in many circumstances. 
DAISY files, Digital Accessible Information Systems stands for. This has become the specialist standard format for use in the creation of accessible format versions for the print impaired. But it's not widely used or even known by the publishing community. It can, however, be the most accessible file format available. It's essentially an XML-based ebook, both text and audio, and it can be explained as a package of digital files that may include one or more digital audio files containing a human or synthesized narration of part or of all of the source text, a marked up file containing some or all of the text, a synchronization file to relate markings in the text file with time points in the audio file, and a navigation control file which enables the user to move smoothly between files while synchronization between text and audio is maintained. The DAISY standard allows the producer full flexibility regarding the mix of text and audio. And the DAISY consortium also offer an open suite of tools, the DAISY pipeline, designed to assist in the creation of DAISY files. So the EPUB format, this is rapidly becoming the universal ebook format for commercial publishers. And with version 3 now available, it's likely to be increasingly seen as a format that's suitable for both commercial exploitation and meeting accessibility needs. It's an open standard for ebook creation and distribution and is the most common file format for commercially available ebooks and can be read on almost all e reader devices. EPUB 3 offers greater scope for accessibility as the new standard converges with the delivery capabilities of the DAISY standard. So EPUB 3 provides the industry with an enhanced ebook standard that can be used widely across different platforms with a variety of content. Now Matt's going to be talking at much greater length about EPUB 3 and I commend his guidelines to you. We at Editor fully endorse this standard and hope to see many of you embracing it. Just very briefly, HTML-based ebooks, these files can be among the most accessible on the market. By using the predominant web technology, you ensure that your customers with disabilities will be well practiced in using the file type with their assistive technology. And finally, XML files, more specifically, all type of XML files that logically tag book files, have the potential to be extremely accessible by their very nature. They contain structure and content, but not appearance. However, end users are unlikely to have generalized XML skills. So these files are likely only to be suitable when dealing with people with an unusually high degree of technical capability or with technically skilled commercial organizations or trusted intermediaries. So your choice of format very often comes down to the type of workflow you are employing and therefore what's available to you. You may be running a highly flexible XML first workflow and this allows you to supply a variety of different formats generated from your base XML. If you read the section in the guidelines entitled how to add structure to your workflow for more information on XML and how to think about including it. But you may be running a more traditional workflow and converting to XML at a later stage, an XML last workflow or you might not be using XML at all, in which case you would probably still look to supply a Word file or a PDF. Now, as we have already said, there are reasonably accessible PDFs and totally inaccessible PDFs. And we hope to have given you some pointers in the guidelines on how to prepare these correctly. But just generally, in preparing your ebook files, there are a number of things that you can do to make sure um, that you your conversion house gets right from the outset. Unlock all the settings so that the appearance of the text can be customized. Enable the text-to-speech option. Include metadata as a standard operation and add structure and navigational tools. And we've got a whole section advising you on how to do this. Archiving is of course key to the successful production of accessible files in-house. A good digital archiving strategy is increasingly vital for all your digital needs. And you should try to archive your files in as many formats as you can. So good archiving and consistent communication with the relevant departments 
will assist you with all of these endeavours. But I'm just going to touch upon one other section in the guidelines concerning handling of inquiries that may be received from those with print impairment or those who support them. It's good practice to locate this responsibility in-house very clearly and make sure that this person has the necessary skills and knowledge. In, in addition, you should ensure that it's straightforward for print impaired people to contact you by registering your details with publisher lookup or access text here in North America and making all contact information clear on your website. Ensure that you respond promptly and facilitate the most effective and speedy response for fulfilling requests. And in addition, make sure you clarify exactly what's being requested. What counts as accessible is different for different people. Once you have established exactly what's required, you may find that there's some difficulty in supplying all of it to the specification requested. The title in question may be heavily illustrated, or it may contain a lot of numeric information which can present an accessibility challenge. But as I've put here, something's better than nothing. And by focusing on what can be supplied, you may actually be able to supply a large proportion of what's actually needed. Make sure that the channels of dialogue are kept open so that if you are able to supply something in the future, which you cannot do today, the user knows about it. This demonstrates your willingness to help and the proactive nature of your company policy. So what can you do straight away, i.e. tomorrow, to get started on an in-house strategy that includes accessibility? It's all very well embracing the guidelines and looking at your workflows, but some of this can take time, and there are a few things you can do immediately to show your com um, commitment to the agenda. I've already mentioned publisher lookup or access text which I urge you to sign up to. By making your details available on these sites, you provide a way to give easy contact information to your customers. And in addition, we'd encourage you to start making use of the newly enhanced code list in the Onyx for Books metadata standard, which includes 14 new descriptive codes for accessibility and has scope for greater enhancement. Greater discoverability of your content leads to better business, to be truly commercial about it, but it also allows your readers to make use of the enhancements that you've built into your file formats. The development of the Onyx Accessible Code List, Code List 196, also forms part of the sister project to the Enabling Technologies Framework Project, and this is the TIGER project. It stands for Trusted Intermediary Global Access Resource. And this again falls under the auspices of WIPO's Visually Impaired Persons Initiative, and it seeks to facilitate cross-border exchange of copyrighted electronic files for books in accessible formats between national libraries and charitable institutions, trusted intermediaries, we call them, serving the blind, visually impaired, and other persons with print disabilities. One of the benefits of this exchange is to significantly expand the repertoire of adapted works available to individual print disabled persons in their countries in the short term. Increased use of electronic source files from publishers and ongoing exchange of books between trusted intermediaries can significantly reduce the cost of production and help further expand the range of accessible books available. Now, there's a TIGER fast track memorandum of understanding set, which is so, sets out a short term arrangement to facilitate early trials of cross border file exchange for accessible ebooks between limited numbers of trusted intermediaries. It's been produced to facilitate early progress on the project while copyright matters are further considered. And a practical, longer term licensing solution will be developed to replace the Tiger MOU for activities beyond the fast track trial. So we're delighted that the companies I've listed here have already signed the Memorandum of Understanding and we urge those of you who haven't to consider doing so. That's all from me today, but I hope to have given you an insight into the type of work that we've been doing. I urge you to get in touch with us for further information on how you can engage with this agenda. Thank you. On your recommendations for action at, at the level of publishing firms, the, the ones you presented all seem geared towards very large corporate enterprises. Yes. Um, yes. Here in Canada, I mean, we have hundreds of firms that vary between maybe one and 15 people yes. on staff and a small pool of freelancers that work together. Uh, 
has thought been given to how smaller firms where the employees have to have more generalized skill sets and work on many, many aspects of the publishing process can address some of these challenges when it's completely unrealistic to actually yeah. devote a significant per portion mm -hmm. of a person's time or a whole salary to yeah. these issues? No, I see what you mean. Um, and I'm, I apologize if, that, if that's the way it came across. The guidelines are intended to be, uh, they've been written for all types of publishing companies in mind. Um, we've, we've made it very directed in, in the advice for specific departments simply because they need to also apply to the larger companies. But pe a lot of people who have um, access, someone handling accessibility in-house, they do it as part of their other role. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be one person's sole responsibility the whole time. Just so long um, as you have a point of contact in-house, I think that really helps to focus um, the company's attention to the issue. Obviously, if there's a handful of four or five of you, it's a little easier to communicate and focus, I would imagine. But um, no, certainly not. They're not meant, to, they're not just written for large corporate organizations yeah. because we've got the long tail in mind. Thank you. Thank you.